Imam Zaid Shakir is amongst the most respected and influential Islamic scholars in the West. As an American Muslim who came of age during the civil rights struggles, he has brought both sensitivity about race and poverty, and poverty issues and scholarly discipline to his faith-based work. He was born in Berkeley, California and accepted Islam in 1977 while he was serving in the United States Air Force. He obtained a BA with honors in international relations at American University in Washington and later earned his master's in political science at Rutgers University. While at Rutgers, he led a successful campaign for divestment or disinvestment from South Africa and co-founded a local Islamic center, Masjid Al-Huda. After a year of studying Arabic in Cairo, Egypt, he settled in New Haven, Connecticut and continued his community activism, co-founding Masjid al-Islam, the Tri-State Muslim Education Initiative and the Connecticut Muslim Coordinating Committee. As Imam of Masjid al-Islam from 98 to 94, he spearheaded a community re renewal and grassroots anti-drug effort and also taught political science and Arabic at Southern Connecticut State University. He then left for Syria to pursue his studies in the traditional Islamic sciences. In 2003, he moved to Hayward, California to serve as a scholar in residence and lecturer at Zaytuna Institute, where he now teaches courses in Arabic, Islamic law, history, and Islamic spirituality. In 2005, Zaytuna Institute published Scattered Pictures, an anthology of diverse essays penned by Zayd Shakir. He is a frequent speaker at local and national Muslim events and has emerged as one of the nation's top Islamic scholars and a voice, for conscience, and a voice of conscience for American and not uh, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Without further ado, I'd like to call upon Imam Zaid Shakir, who is also the chairman of United for Change. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbul Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidi al-Mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, before I get started, there's uh, two things we want to do. First of all, I want to thank everyone who participated, especially the organizers, the volunteers, all of the Muslim community here in Montreal. The second thing is I believe that some of the volunteers from Islamic Relief have buckets. We want everyone to, if you have a checkbook, to write a check, or if you have cash in your pocket, I'll start with myself, I actually have some Canadian money I understand here they don't call it loonies and toonies, but I still have some to put in the bucket because uh, Islamic Relief, in addition to all of the uh, wonderful work they do all over the world uh, for Muslims and non-Muslims, as is the case in Haiti, bringing relief, bringing uh, the means to a, a more dignified life, bringing help and assistance, they also financed this program. So they took a collection earlier for orphans, but now we want to, and they didn't ask me to do this, but take a collection for them to help cover the expense of the program. Flying speakers in, getting plane tickets, rent, uh, hotel rooms, uh, renting this hall. There were a lot of expenses involved, so if the volunteers can pass the buckets and get the cash and the checks, and if all of you can be generous, to give something that would be tremendously appreciated uh, by them and by all of the organizers. We also like to thank the volunteers who sacrificed their times. A lot of time the volunteers are outside. They're not here listening to the uh, lectures and speeches and panels and, and being uplifted and instructed and motivated. Uh, they're out in the hallways organizing the traffic, keeping things moving smoothly. So. May Allah Ta'ala bless them. Uh, we want to talk about domestic <laughs> violence, but not in the typical way it's usually approached. So we're not going to try to determine, uh, because most of you have read about these things, what does the darba mean in fadri buhun, what does it mean, uh, etc. But we want to talk about it uh, from another angle and to remind all of ourselves not to flee from this or other controversial topics, to deal with them, because these are issues that are real, and they're issues that are eating away at our community, such as domestic violence, uh, and many, many other issues, drug addiction. We have drug addiction amongst some of our youth. We have uh, illegitimate, sexual relations. We have some of our girls coming up pregnant. 
We have all of these problems that we find in the wider society and we're not going to deal with them by pretending or denying their existence. So abuse is inextricably associated with violence. It's usually the result of violence. And violence is more than physical force. Violence can be neglect. Violence can be shouting. Violence can be subtle means of intimidation. Violence can be psychological manipulation. Violence can be many other things, but violence has another meaning that a lot of us don't pay attention to. And that is to distort something to such an extent that we no longer recognize it for what it is. We know this, many of you study literature, and you've seen the phrase that uh, the editor, for example, the editor did such violence to the text that we can no longer recognize the author's original intent. How many of you have heard a usage something like that? Okay, so we have people who are familiar with that. The reason I say that is that when we allow abuse to exist in our homes, in our family, in our relationships, many times as a result of the violence that we perpetrate against each other, we in turn do violence to Islam so that it is not recognizable for what it is. And this is uh, consistent with what Dr. Yasser Al-Qadi was saying, when these people in the name of so-called jihad inflict violence on innocent people, the majority of them Muslims, inflict violence on people who have nothing to do with harming Islam or Muslims in any way. They in turn do violence to Islam so that it's not recognizable for what it is. And as Dr. Umar Abdul Kathy mentioned, that distorted image of Islam that Muslims in some instances are responsible for in turn becomes the basis for people hating Islam and for people seeing Islam as something vile and something ugly and something despicable. But it is not Islam. It is that distortion. It is that caricature that is a result of the violence that's been done against Islam itself. And when we allow abuse and violence to exist in our homes, we are distorting Islam. We're distorting Islam and the people that suffer the most, as was mentioned this morning by more than one of our speakers, are our children. Our children. How many of you are from Vancouver? Vancouver. Are you familiar with, I, I think I'm, I hope I don't mispronounce, Dr. Gabra Mate, who runs the Free Needle Distribution Clinic. You're familiar? He's an expert. This is a, a Hungarian Jew in Vancouver. He runs a clinic where it's the only clinic in North America, Canada or the United States, where heroin addicts can come and shoot up with clean needles. And if they overdose, they can be revived because they're medical staff. And, some pe and Islamically, we can discuss this. This will be a good case study as to the objectives of the law. Usually we say alcohol and drugs affect the mind. And Islam has been instituted to preserve the mind. So it's been instituted to preserve religion and these things are ranked in a prioritized, prioritized scheme to preserve religion, to preserve life, to preserve the mind. So the drug addict is affecting their mind immediately. So drugs are forbidden. But when they use dirty needles, they're affecting their life. So by giving them clean needles, he's preserving their lives. By bringing them into an environment where if they overdose, they can be uh, uh, revived by trained medical and competent physicians, he's preserving their lives. And that has a prior, a higher prioritization than preserving their intellect. So I'm not saying we should have 
needle clinics. I'm just saying we should think about these things at a deeper level. He also has a program to get them off of drugs, which doesn't work when they're in the streets because in the streets, no one has shown them compassion. And this is the point I want to make. He is, his expertise is on the effects of abuse on children. And his research has shown that abuse is the primary, in childhood, is the primary cause of addictions. And addictions take many forms. For some people, it's drugs. For some people, it's shopping. There are people addicting to shop, addicted to shopping. To some people, it's sexual relations. Some people are addicted to that. For some people, it's eating. They're addicted to eating. But he just, his research shows in every case, the addiction, as far as his research is concerned, results from violence that was afflicted upon that child during their formative years. And that violence creates a void in that child that they subsequently try to fill with these various addictions. When he creates an environment of compassion, and for many of these people who have been abused in their childhood, for the first time they're in contact with compassionate people, he begins to create in them the security and the sense of self and confidence that they need to escape their addiction. And he finds that many of them go to the detox program and are freed from the addiction to heroin or other destructive drugs. Now the point, brothers and sisters, when we are engaged in arguing, when we're engaged in insulting, belittling, and berating, when we're engaged in physical violence in our homes, our children are affected by that violence and it creates a void within them. It distorts their development. It distorts their personality. And that violence doesn't have to be direct. Another thing he found in his research and is published, his experience as a Jew in Nazi Germany. He was constantly crying. His mother took him to a doctor and she said, my child is doing something very strange. He cries all the time. The doctor told her it's not, it's not, it's not strange. All of the Jewish children are constantly crying. He says this environment that they're in, in Nazi Germany is so stressful for the parents that the children are internalizing the stress of their parents and as a result of that, they're crying because they don't know any other way to express that internalized stress. Our children internalize the state of our homes and this is why it's so important that the love and mercy that was talked about by Dr. Omar and others, Dr. Mohammed uh, al-Bashir and others, it has to be present if we are concerned not only for our well-being, but for the well-being of our children. Because just as our children internalize the stress and the tension from the arguments, from the, 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 the disputes, from the, the anger and frustration, they internalize the positive energy that's created by the love and the mercy. He's made between you love and mercy. Surely in this are signs for those who reflect. We have to reflect on the teachings of our religion. Allah Ta'ala tells us to reflect. He tells us to think. He tells us to use our intellect. And this is a vital part of our religion because our religion is not a system of do's and don'ts. The do's and don'ts in the Quran compared to the verses that contain of moral and ethical, spiritual import are very, very few and we all know that. The same thing for the hadith. 
the hadith of legislative import compared to the entire corpus of hadith are very few. But we sometimes forget that. Allah Ta'ala mentions, as was mentioned throughout the day, وَقَضْنَ مِنْكُمْ مِثَاقًا غَلِيظًا They've taken you with a weighty covenant. They, the women, the, the bonds between you are established on the basis of a weighty covenant. Allah Ta'ala reminds us, as Dr. Umar gave a beautiful, beautiful explanation of هُنَّ لِبَاسٌ لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لِبَاسٌ لَهُمْ that they are garments for you and you are garments for them. And he elaborated far more eloquently and far more powerfully than I could. But these are things for us to reflect on as how the nature of our relationships with our spouses should be. Allah Ta'ala reminds us, وَعَشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And dwell with them in goodness. And as it was explained, goodness that you would show to a member of your very fa family, your very kith and kin. The same affection you would show to your sister. The same affection you would show to your mother, to your aunties. That's the level of affection. That's the level of tenderness. That's the level of gentleness you should display to your wife. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعْلَ بَيْنُكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتِ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ From his signs he's made for you spouses, from yourselves. For what? To dwell with them in peace and tranquility. And he's made between you love and mercy. Surely in this are signs for people who reflect. This is our religion. Allah Ta'ala mentions, Ya ibadi, Hadith Qudsi, not Quran, Ya ibadi, inni haramtu zulma ala nafsi, wa ja'altu baynukum muharrama, fala tazalamu. O my servant, I've forbidden oppression for myself and I've made it forbidden amongst you, therefore do not oppress one another. This is our religion. And this is what we have to bring to life in our homes. In our schools, our messages, our institutions, our relationships with each other, we have to rid them of any oppression. And this becomes the basis of our power as a community. This is what will speak for us. This is what will delegitimize all of the negative things that are put out against our community. We, don't, we won't have to speak a word because our actions will be more powerful than any words that we could ever speak, but our actions will never be powerful. They'll never be meaningful. They'll never be able to repel all of the negative words until they're real and they're deep and they're sincere and they're inspired, inspired actions that are motivated by a desire to articulate, to embody the lessons, the teachings of our religion in our lives in our families, in our homes, in our institutions, in our relationships with each other. Our coming together, this is an articulation of what Islam is all about. Our ability to come here and share with each other, to speak with each other, to address each other around common issues, despite the fact we might have different uh, orientations in terms of how we see the religion. This is what United for Change is all about. And this is what is going to change our ummah. When we realize we might differ on some particulars, but on the universals we are totally united. And that only by being totally united on the universals are we going to do our part to hand this religion on to those who will come after us. Because this is a communal project. It's not an individual project. It is not the project for individual groups or organizations or institutions. It is a project for our community just as it was the project of those communities that preceded us. Collectively, they handed the religion on. And collectively, we have to take the responsibility to hand the religion on to those after us. Uh, uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani mentions in Fatul al-Bari his commentary on Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, the phrase of related by Ibn Abbas, from the Prophet 
Deliver this message from me even to the extent of a single verse you might know. He said, if everyone conveys their verse or two or three, their hadith or two or three, what they know about this religion, collectively, we will pass the religion on. This is our communal responsibility, brothers and sisters. This is Islam. This is Islam. And if anyone wants to report back, because there are people at the conference who are doing reports and they have to report to their superiors. What were they calling the people to? Put this in the report. They were calling the people to be greater than what the world has made you. This is what we're calling people to. To use Islam to empower yourself to become greater than what the world has made you or me or us. The world might have made some of us drug addicts. Not our parents, the world, the conditions, the circumstances that we find ourselves in might have made some of us drug addicts. The world might have made some of us racist. I can't stand people of that race. The world might have made us racist. The world might have made us so materially greedy that we can't even begin to think of the rights that other people have in the material wealth of this world. We want it all for ourselves. We want everything we can get our hands on. And if we usurp someone else's right to clean water or to clean air or to clean or, or to non-genetically modify food, we don't care. We want everything we can get. That's what the world might have made us. But religion, and in our case, Islam, is calling us to rise above what the world has made us. It's calling us to seek the forgiveness of our Lord and paradise. And if we really understood what that means, we will be empowered to overcome whatever the world has made us. All of us. This has been summarized in two verses in Quran and we relate these verses to bring us back specifically to the topic of domestic violence. Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Hasten to forgiveness from your Lord and a paradise whose expanse is, as, is, is greater than the expanse of the heavens and the earth that has been prepared for those who are conscious of Allah. So hasten to forgiveness and paradise. And then he says, The first thing he mentions in terms of what that hastening involved. What are the keys to forgiveness and to paradise? Those who spend, rather it is easy or difficult. Now why is this important? What is the relationship? The relationship is until we let go of the world, it will be difficult for us to work the deeds of those who are the people of paradise. Because until we let go of the world, the world will not let go of us. And as long as we're holding on to the world, the world will hold on to us. Spending is one of the immediate ways we let go of the world. This is said, spending, and our scholars mention this, when we spend our wealth, we're letting go of the world. And when we condition ourselves to let the world go, we empower ourselves to do things that are beyond our physical capability. We empower ourselves to do things that are predicated not on physical strength, but on spiritual strength. This is the key. So when we spend, when we let go of the world, we're able to overcome our anger. So Allah Ta'ala mentions, and those who restrain their anger. Because now the world has let go of us. 
We see this in Ramadan. In Ramadan, we let go of the world. How does the world hold on to us? It holds on to us through sleep. It holds on to us through eating. It holds on through us, uh, to us through the connections we have with other people. It holds on to us through talking. Ramadan helps, cuts down on our eating, obviously. It cuts down on our sleeping. If we're staying up late, especially this time of year, as Ramadan moves into the summer for taraweeh, we're not getting home until after midnight. Then a couple hours later, we have to get up for suhoor, right? It cut down on our talking. We don't have the energy, and if we observe the etiquette of the fast, we know that we can't speak the, the way we usually speak because that has qawlu zur and other unacceptable forms of speech that are against the etiquette of the fast. And if we're really serious about Ramadan, we try to do antikaf, 10 days preferably, two or three days, a little bit, in reviving the sunnah of our Prophet wasallam, and that cuts down our, on our worldly relationship, and that releases our spiritual power, so we find the energy and strength to do spiritual deeds we can't do outside of Ramadan. Some of us, we pray taraweeh, an hour and a half. Two hours, depending on the speed of the imam's recitation. Outside of Ramadan, we can barely squeeze out five minutes, qiyam al layl We start one rakat, two rakats, we start dozing off, we go to bed. We read the Qur'an, two or three khatams in Ramadan, and the only thing restricting us, we have to stop and go to work. If we had time, we could read Qur'an all day in Ramadan, because we're cutting down on those things that chain us to the world and to our physical self. Outside of Ramadan, one page, two page, we're nodding off, we're drooling on our phone. And we close the mushaf, we go to bed or turn on the television. So when we reduce our connection to the world, then the world's ability to hold us and restrain us is limited and then our spiritual energy comes out and we can control our anger. And how, may, how much violence and abuse is, exists in our homes, our relationship, because we cannot control our anger. And they pardon people. Again, how many of our problems come because we can't pardon? We, we're holding a grudge against our wife or our husband for something they mistakenly said 10 years ago. And Allah loves those who strive for moral perfection. To use a translation Dr. Omar used earlier in the day for Ihsan, a beautiful translation, moral perfection. We won't get there, but we strive for it. And Allah loves those who strive for moral perfection. So if in our homes, we're striving for moral perfection. The man, the woman, the children, the parents. If in our relationships with each other, we're striving for moral perfection. In our communities, in our organizations and institutions, we're striving for moral perfection. What kind of community, what kind of marriages, what kind of relationships between parent and child, child and parent, friends and neighbors, what kind of relationships will we have, brothers and sisters, if we're striving for moral perfection? Knowing that this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something that He loves. So, brothers and sisters, this is our religion. This is Islam. Islam doesn't want us, as was mentioned, I forget who said it, to come to the minimal standards that the law introduces. Islam. Islam wants us to rise to the level of ihsan. People who are striving for moral perfection. This is what our religion is calling us to. And when we take this call seriously, we will be reformed, our families will be reformed, our communities will be reformed, and who our position in the world will be reformed. And it is not easy. It is not easy. And that's why it's called the jihad, to bring up the J word again. We mentioned it in Juma. 
Yes, Dr. Yasser al-Qadi mentioned it. And I'm going to mention it again. Jihad is a beautiful term that we should reclaim. It's been stolen from us. And not just by irresponsible, reckless, and downright, in some instances, stupid Muslims. It's been st stolen by some narrow-minded, bigoted people who want to paint Muslims into a corner that we cannot even speak in our own language. We cannot even take pride in our religion. We have to reclaim. And Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who engage in jihad for our sake. And this jihad, one of its greatest manifestations is the jihad against ourselves. To overcome the base inclinations of our soul. To overcome those things our worldly circumstances have made us. So that we can be those people striving for moral excellence. It is a jihad. And it's called a jihad because it is difficult. It is hard. It is intense. It requires sacrifice. It requires energy and effort and focus. It requires knowledge and study and commitment. But those who engage in that struggle, Allah Ta'ala says, subulana. We will guide them in our paths, the paths that lead to Allah Ta'ala. And those are good paths. And if we're on those paths, and if we're grabbing our husband or our wife by the hand, if we're grabbing our children or parents by the hand and pulling them along with us as we move down that path, brothers and sisters, we're going to be a powerful community. We're going to be a beautiful community. And we pray that this conference, we can't solve the problems of the world in a conference, but we pray that this conference has motivated you to look for the things that will help you to move on those paths. We pray that this conference has motivated you to look at the religion as far more than just a series of do's and don'ts, rules and strictures, but as something that is, is desirous of, of, of cleansing us and purifying us and elevating us and bringing out the best of, of who we are as a human being and more importantly as a servant of our Lord and as a follower of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tomorrow there'll be specific workshops by Sheikh Faraz Rabbani and others to begin the process of connecting the knowledge and the resources and the, uh, the, the, the structure that we need to move with more confidence on that path. We pray that all of you can take part in that. Inshallah ta'ala, we promised the organizers, I myself, I have a marriage and family relations seminar, two-day seminar that we do to come here to Montreal for that. The time is up. They're saying stop. So I'm going to respect that, even though I didn't respect it five minutes ago. When they first put it up, I respect it now. May Allah Ta'ala bless all of you. May you have a safe trip to your home. If you didn't put anything in the Islamic relief bucket, when it went around, put it as you leave out, inshallah, to help that fine or, uh, organization. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.